So now for this webinar, we have changed. Season three. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, change the mode of presentation here. Uh, we are doing the case presentation. And we have three speakers. Those who will be presenting the cases, Dr. Sanjog Kazbiye, Dr. Satish Lahoti, and Dr. Sandeep Piratwar. Dr. Sanjay Gazvi and uh, Dr. Lahoti will be in the session one. And uh, the moderators for this session will be Dr. Pramod Giri. And panelists are Dr. Kishore Choudhury, Dr. Paritosh Pandey, and Dr. Anil Karapukur, sir. And for the second session, uh, speakers uh, is uh, Dr. Sandeep Piratwar, and moderators is Dr. Suresh Sankla. And the panelists, we have uh, Dr. Atul Goyal, he may be joining on phone or Dr. Sushil Patkar and Dr. Pravin Sarun. Uh, the brief program is uh, the brief program of today's uh, webinar is uh, we'll be having a short program inauguration of uh, MCNS newsletter. Then the case presentation by Dr. Uh, Sanjog and Dr. Sajish Lahoti. Dr. Sanjog will be uh, talking on the endoscopic assisted clipping of pica segment aneurysm in Taylor-Hillar approach. And there are two cases by Dr. Satish Lahoti. The first will be coiling of pica and SCA aneurysms in single setting. And second will be a ruptured dissecting aneurysm of the base of top treated by control devices. And uh, the second case will be management of atlantic axial dislocation at a rural hospital by Dr. Sandeep Piratpa, and then uh, it will be followed by the discussion by the panelist. So before starting the webinar, we are having uh, our small uh, function of inauguration of, of the MCNS newsletter, MCNS Times. So for this program, I have invited uh, Dr. Tattva Prasan Kartikar, president of the MCNS, Dr. Dev Pujari, sir and editor Dr. Sudhir Ambekar. So I would like to request Dr. Uh, Prasanna uh, Kadikar, President of the MCNS, to say a few words about the newsletter. Good evening. We had a very, very active discussion on our WhatsApp, but unfortunately it was not being archived. So we thought about starting a newsletter and the newsletter, we will be able to have the articles which can be archived and can be used for the future. So we had spoken to Dr. Devapujari sir about it and he has encouraged us to do that. Uh, I would like to, to thank Dr. Milind Dunake and Dr. Sudhir Ambekar for diligently working on it. And we are able to bring out the first inaugural issue uh, in our within a three months time. We are planning to have an issue every three months and we want to still, still do something more after that. And we are very much thankful to all the authors who has helped us in time to send the articles. And I wish that we will be able to do it actively and we will be able to give it a good shape. So I would request Dr. Nijim Dunak here to take over. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Katika, sir, for your uh, uh, encouraging words. I would like to request Dr. Dev Pujari, sir, to say a few words about the newsletter and declare it as uh, declare uh, the inauguration. Thank you. So thank you for the honor, Dr. Kartikar, Dr. Dunake. Uh, I am really happy that uh, we have started this activity and it is properly uh, named the MCNS Times. And I think it will reflect the times in MCNS, uh, which we are uh, sort of progressing. I think the progress all around us is very, very visible, but uh, one of the ancient Indian failing has been documentation. And this is one way that we can document our work. We can probably invite critical comments and we can probably, uh, you know, interact with us better with uh, more backings. Many a times we talk without uh, much evidence or do not get much time to uh, reflect upon it or do not get much time to even uh, explain it. And this gives you uh, that much of a, uh, not only freedom, but an opportunity to state your case much better and allow criticism. And uh, my 
sincere request to Ambekar would be that uh, from the next newsletter, you should probably have uh, uh, a page reserved for comments uh, on the on the material which has been given in the previous uh, edition, which will uh, probably make it more uh, complete. There is always a crisis. I think it's it's very nice to uh, inaugurate for myself. And I was hoping that we are having the screen share where you can actually show the first page of your MCNS Times for inauguration, like we do in a physical meeting. Is that possible, uh, Dr. Uh, Sudhir? Yes, sir, but I am. I think the host has disabled screen sharing. So, now I... Who is the host in this meeting? I am sure you will be able to do it immediately. Uh, it says I am the host, but I do not have the... I think Dr. Ambegar has to be the host. So, whoever is managing, please uh, make him the host so that you can actually see the uh, first copy. And I always feel, and it is always said that uh, something for something to be successful, it is not the first edition. It is the second edition, which is going to tell us how good we are and how serious we are about it and how much is the possibility of it continuing. And by third, I think we'll get into the proper group. So I am, I'm very happy to inaugurate this and I really wish it all the success with great contributions from several stalwarts which are uh, in our group, we'll probably be able to, uh, uh, you know, produce something worthwhile reading. I know there are some state associations which are already doing it. I think Tamil Nadu is already doing it. Uh, the Northeast is doing it as three or four states together. Their journal has become quite popular. So I'm, I'm very sure in times to come, uh, we'll probably be able to do a good job and we'll probably be able to uh, develop this into something more than uh, what it is today. So thank you very much for this opportunity and I wish it all the best. Thanks, Sudhir and Dr. Kartikar and Milind again. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Dr. S Dr. Ambekar, will you please uh, show the, the, the first inaugural issue? So, uh, thank you for this opportunity. Uh, I think uh, we're better late than never. So, we have uh, finally started uh, uh, the newsletter. Uh, we had a little bit of discussion whether to have an official, uh, you know, the discussion sort of all the similar to a journal or whether it has to be an unofficial newsletter. But I think at least in the first uh, uh, issue, and I think all of us are on the same page that it has to be slightly, uh, there have to be non-academic articles also that can, uh, 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 you know, help us, uh, help all the younger generation like me and others also to understand not just about the technique and the intricacies of neurosurgery, but also regarding some, uh, how to develop our practice and how to, uh, be a better human being. So uh, we have various sections in this newsletter. First is, uh, uh, of course, there are a couple of articles on uh, how I do it. These are from other experts in the, in the field and uh, they will serve as a goalpost for or a reference point for all of us to go through in the last minute as uh, whenever we are planning for any surgery. Uh, apart from uh, this, we have uh, an, uh, a section on interesting cases. We have a section on uh, pathology also, an interesting pathology article. Dr. Meghna Chaugle was very, uh, uh, she obliged and she, she was the first one to send the article. Uh, and I really thank her for this. Um, we have a two articles which are not exactly academic, but they have great relevance to our uh, neurosurgical practice by Dr. Lokendri Singh, sir, and Masla Turel. And uh, I'm hoping that uh, uh, everyone will be happy uh, to read all these articles. Again, as uh, Devpujari sir said, it is not the first uh, uh, 
issue the forthcoming issues are most important for us i request all the uh, members to actively participate and contribute to uh, the upcoming newsletters and uh, if there are any queries or anything any suggestions please uh, uh, feel free to call me or contact me at any point of time i'll be uh, uh, you're most welcome thank you very much thank you sudhir <laughs> sorry sir i was uh, discussing for yeah, some time uh, after this i would like to request uh, dr pramod giri to take over and uh, start the webinar dr giri sir and i conclude that this program is over uh, good evening everybody and uh, we are really thankful to dr uh, dev pujari sir for inaugurating this uh, newsletter session and i think that we should give a great applaud to the newsletter team so everybody should clap right now for the team we will start today's session as uh, as we all have done the nice last session very nicely and uh, continuing with that uh, as per the instructions of the senior members of this uh, mcna chapter we are continuing with this the case presentation series so in this case presentation series we are having two beautifully uh, rather uh, done cases as well as the uh, we will be having a great discussion on it today so uh, little bit controversial topics but definitely for the benefit of the younger generations this uh, topics have been kept purposefully so the first case will be um, posterior circulation aneurysms done surgically as well as done by the intervention radiologist at our place so first case uh, by dr sanjog gajbi is a assistant professor to me and uh, second by dr satish lauti is consultant intervention radiologist so both will be presenting the circulation posterior circulation cases first done by surgically and second by the endovascular way so the forum is open today the first case by dr sanjog gajbi good evening everyone uh, thank you very much to the mcns committee uh, am i audible hello <clears throat> yeah so uh, thank you very much to for to the mcns committee for allowing me to present this case today i am going to be presenting a case of tilo vilo tonsillar uh, approach uh, endoscope assisted clipping of the tilo vilo tonsillar pica aneurysm the this case was done at the super speciality hospital and gmc nagpur the chief neurosurgeon was dr giri sir and i was the first assistant this lady was a 50 year old lady who presented to us with a history of sudden severe headache and loss of consciousness 7 days back she presented with history of multiple you have not made it you have not made it uh, been uh, you know full screen full screen make it full screen okay presentation mode presentation mode which mode sir third yes. third on the left at the bottom share share <clears throat> third third on the left on the bottom uh no we are not full screen make it full screen okay sir okay okay uh like you see the three tabs at the bottom uh the th you should click on the third one at the moment you are on the first one okay you you know that the 69% is written yeah, here just just left to the just click to the left of 69% oh i'm not able to see 69% on the right bottom if you can see the scale minus plus signs and 69% next to it at the bottom sanjog okay sir you are at the top come at the bottom at the bottom right corner the bottom right corner bring your cursor there cursor yes i am bringing my cursor there but i am not able to see uh, or the earlier thing you can start the slide show also 
the slide show will also do that yeah slide just show. resume resume slide show click yes, on resume, resume slide, slide show. show just a minute sir yes sir this one yes yeah that one okay well done not done yet sir hmm. thank you sir can you see the full screen now sir no no probably click again okay sir and just carry on yeah can you see see the video see the full screen sir now no we can't but just forget it just carry on carry on carry on yeah. hmm. i think why waste time on this okay uh, sir so the moving ahead with the history the patient presented with a history of multiple episodes of vomiting the severe neck pain suggestive of meningitis she did not have any um, neurological deficits and no comorbidities we did a plain ct head followed by a ct angiography the plain ct head showed um, fourth ventricle uh, hemorrhage and the ct angiography as we can see showed a saccular aneurysm uh, at the pica uh, on the pica artery and uh, we then did a 3d recon the 3d recon uh, images clearly show a saccular aneurysm with the pundus pointing towards the right located at the p4 segment of the pica aneurysm the one sec one sec you have not gone beyond see? the first slide yeah can you any you have not gone beyond the first slide yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> we didn't see the slide of the history we have not seen the slide of the ct okay uh, come out and do it again i think yeah come out and do it again just a minute sir so do we see the full screen now no not yet if you can go on to the next slide we are so i've gone to the next slide now can you see the next slide no no, no. your slides are not moving by the icon above try to start the slide show you are not coming down you are clicking only on that uh so actually on my screen the I, hmm. it is a full screen and the slide show has also started actually on okay. my laptop screen sir no please start it again you have unshared yes, start yes, share again. share share your screen again yes sir no no next slide now we can see the second slide yes sir now i'm just clicking again on yeah, the slide please. show yeah can, can we that's better we can see the second slide ha i think you you just yes, go sir. one by one yeah. go one by one yes sir yeah. click so now we can do the third slide yeah. carry on like yes, that sir. yes sir yes so so this is the slide showing the ct scans the ct scan showed a fourth ventricle hemorrhage and the ct angio showed a saccular aneurysm in the uh, right pica artery uh, we did a 3d reconstruction of the ct angio where we could see a saccular aneurysm arising from the p4 segment of the right pica artery the fundus pointing towards the right side the right pica had a low origin on the vertebral artery the left vertebra the right vertebral artery was hypoplastic the right vertebral artery was dominant in this circulation 
<clears throat> so with a working diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage due to rupture of the uh, distal pica telovelo tonsillar segment artery aneurysm we uh, proceeded for the surgery due to some logistic reasons we could not proceed do the uh, dsa of this patient uh, we planned to do a midline suboccipital craniectomy and clip the aneurysm by a telovelo tonsillar approach uh, this uh, this was the midline suboccipital craniectomy that we did the rim of the foramen magnum was also removed then the on we opened the dura in a standard y shaped um, fashion and on opening the dura we could see the subarachnoid hemorrhage even on the in the sister through the arachnoid of the cisterna magna we can see that the um, it is csf is hemorrhagic hemorrhage tinged on opening the csf cisterna magna we um, we release the subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, just a moment i'll have to play this video i'll play the video separately since the video isn't being played i don't think it is playing so i'll play the video separately just just a sec just give me a second yeah So can you see the video here? Yeah. No. Just a minute. So I'll just. So can you see the video here? Yes. Now it's okay. Go ahead. So can we see the video on the screen? Yes, yes. yes we can. Okay. Yes, we can see the video now. Explain. So on this that. video, we could see that uh, the, there is a bilobe uh, saccular aneurysm mm -hmm. on the right pica artery, the telovelo tonsillar segment, and it was at the junction of the cord cranial loop. We applied a straight clip, and uh, before applying the clip, we inserted a zero degree endoscope to check for the um, whether the neck has been dissected completely or not. And after clipping, also we inserted a endoscope. to see for the completeness of the clipping uh, inserting the endoscope allowed us to minimally uh, uh, manipulate the neck of the aneurysm at the 6 o'clock 7 o'clock position we can see that the clip has been completely applied and the neck has been completely secured <clears throat> So, uh, to summarize the video uh, this was the, the first diagram shows that the right pica uh, the and the telovelo tonsillar loop was giving rise to the aneurysm then the bilobed aneurysm can be seen clearly thirdly the after separating the cerebellar tonsils we approach the um we could completely clip the aneurysm the straight clip was applied at the aneurysm neck and the endoscope was inserted to see the completeness of the uh, clipping post operatively the patient was extubated uneventfully uh, patient was conscious oriented there was there were no neurological deficits no other issues and the patient was the, the discharged on post op day 7 in the current follow up also the patient is completely free of any neurological deficits uh So in spite of technical constraints like unavailability of dsa we still proceeded with the the surgical clipping on the basis of ct angiography and 3d reconstruction uh, endoscope was used to define the neck of the aneurysm and the fundus of the aneurysm distal pica aneurysm especially at the p4 segments can be accessed by the midline suboccipital craniectomy and the telovelo tonsillar approach uh, in this case use of angled endoscope would have allowed a detailed visualization of the neck of the aneurysm without any much uh, manipulation thank you sir thank you dr sanju Thank you. sir i think uh, discussion and question answers we will take after the second case sir
Yep, and uh, I will uh, like to request uh, Dr. Satish Lauti to present his case, posterior circulation aneurysm, uh, pica aneurysm and superior cerebellar artery aneurysm done endovascularly. Dr. Satish Lauti. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, at, the, at the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, the entire MCNS uh, faculty and Professor Giri sir for providing me this opportunity to present this case on such a huge platform. Uh, there's some error in my camera, so probably you'll not be able to see me, but uh, I hope you can hear me well. We can hear you and we can see your slides. Yes. So we can see your screen. Satish, you can continue. Yes. You can see the screen. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Thank you. So uh, I'm presenting only one case because uh, it itself is going to consume around 10 to 15 minutes. It's a rupture dissecting aneurysm of the basilar top treated endovascularly. Uh, the case is a 50-year-old female who presented with sudden onset severe headache. Uh, this is the CT showing uh, some a very minute amount of bleed and some hyperdensity in the uh, ventral aspect of the midbrain uh, with some uh, dilatation of the temporal horns. So a diagnosis of subarachnoid hemorrhage was made. Uh, MRI was done. MRI showed again a thrombosed aneurysm on the ventral aspect of the midbrain. Uh, this is the MR angio done. MR angio showed a narrowed bacillar, uh, more narrow towards the distal tip. No obvious aneurysm was seen as such on the MR angio. So the patient was taken for DSA. These are the DSA images. Uh, DSA shows uh, uh, tapering of the distal half of the bacillar artery. Uh, bilateral superior cerebral arteries and posterior cerebral artery is not visualized. Uh, so probably it was a completely thrombosed aneurysm not seen at this stage, in the acutely ruptured stage. Uh, both the posterior cerebral arteries had fetal origin. As you can see here, this is the right PCA and this is the left PCA. So both the PCAs were filling uh, from the anterior circulation. So at this stage, we managed the patient conservatively. She did well. Uh, she was discharged uh, at around 10 to 12 days. Then we called her for a repeat DSA after three weeks. So, this is sorry. the done after three weeks. I'm sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt. There's a lot of background noise. Can we mute someone? Who's... Can we uh, can we mute everybody except the speaker? Yeah, can I continue? Yes, please. So, this was the DSA done three weeks later. Now, the DSA is showing a uh, dissecting aneurysm at the top of the basilar artery. The distal half of the bacillar is narrowed and there is a, a aneurysm measuring around 6 mm in width and around 5 mm in neck with a small daughter sac at the superior uh, superior tip. Uh, posterior cerebral arteries are still not visualized and both the superior cerebellar arteries are arising from the body of the aneurysm. This is the right superior cerebellar artery and this is the left superior cerebellar artery. Both are arising from the body of the aneurysm. The bacillar artery is ending into the base of the body of the aneurysm. So this was a very difficult anatomy to treat. Uh, I think it was uh, difficult surgically. So we opted for uh, an endovascular management of this patient. So the target here was uh, to preserve both the superior cerebellar arteries as well as to uh, obliterate the aneurysm. So endovascularly, a few options were thought of. Uh, uh, putting a stent over here to preserve the right SCA, another stent in the left SCA and coiling the superior part. But this would have been really difficult because this putting in stents in such small uh, vessels would have uh, led to the occlusion of the vessels. So the other option was to keep this uh, right SCA flowing, left SCA flowing, uh, pack off the, to pack off the uh, dome of the basilar artery and, but as it is and put something here to uh, support the coils in the distal half of the uh, aneurysm. So this yellow segment line, we needed something to put here. So we decided to take the contour device. Contour, this is a contour device, which uh, is basically a flow diverting device, device for a wide necked aneurysm. Uh, it, it, it sits into the base of the, it sits into the base of the aneurysm covering the neck and provides a flow diverting effects. If additional coils are put into the distal uh, segment of the aneurysm, uh, it further reduces the bleeding risk in the immediate uh, post-op period. So this is how the device looks. Uh, this is a chart which uh, provides us the uh, approximate size of the contour which would be needed. So our aneurysm was around 5 mm at neck and uh, around 6 mm in width. 
so we took a 9 mm uh, contour device which goes through a 0 to 1 micro catheter so the hardware we used uh, we took a right femoral puncture with a 8 french short sheath a uh, long sheath was taken in the left vertebral artery and a fargo max 070 guide catheter was taken through the long sheath so these are the images uh, this is the road map uh, this is the echelon 10 micro catheter for the coiling part of the aneurysm so this is being tracked through the left vertebral artery through the basilar artery towards the basilar aneurysm here we have entered the basilar aneurysm you can see this is the wire wire over the wire this micro catheter gets tracked into the aneurysm this is the coiling micro catheter here you can if you can see this uh, this is the tip where the uh, coiling micro catheter is now placed now this is the second uh, micro catheter through which the contour device will be brought this is the tip of the coiling micro catheter and this is the tip of the uh, uh, neuro slider 21 through which the contour device will be brought in so here you can see this is the contour device being tracked into the aneurysm can you see the video please this is the contour device being tracked into the aneurysm we see the tip of the catheter but we don't see the contour coming in So yeah. can you see the video i am showing the video separately actually no it's not playing it's, it's not playing okay actually the earlier part was playing now it is not playing yeah yeah there it is moving now uh that is you please play this video now so the separate it videos is. are not uh, coming onto the screen so it had started then you stopped it so just give me a minute If you have the videos with you, you can go out of the presentation, show the videos, and then go back to the presentation. Can you see the videos now? No. No. Just now we are seeing your slides. Okay. So the video is not playing probably. so this is the contour device if you can see the contour has been deployed at the base of neck of the aneurysm and after the deployment of the contour the coils are placed at the distal end of the contour to pack the distal dome of the aneurysm so this is sequential uh, coiling of the aneurysm and this is the final result so the dome of the aneurysm is now completely packed both the scs are filling well here you can see in the subtracted view this is the contour deployed this is the tip of the contour at the top of the basilar artery and this is the mass of the aneurysm uh, mass of the coils into the aneurysm this is the ap view and this is the lateral view so this is that device which can be seen this is the umbrella like device which is placed into the distal basilar artery and provides a scaffolds for the coils to be put into the aneurysm this is the lateral view here again you can see this contour placed well and the coil mass lying superiorly to the contour device so patient was then discharged well uh, at 6 month follow up when patient came for a dsa this is the 6 month follow up complete obliteration of the aneurysm both the scs filling well so this is how the complex case of this basilar top dissecting aneurysm was treated thank you thank you satish uh, i think uh, the forum is open for the questions we have a uh, great uh, experts like dr anil karapurkar sir dr paritosh uh, dr suresh sakla sir dr dev pujari sir for the discussion part so anyone can put up the questions if i may start i think uh, we'll start with the second case of satish is he done sir. a very good job 
this is a very difficult aneurysm as you can see from the anatomy of the aneurysm it's a small dome at the top yes what the, what i'm uh, wondering at is why did we not see it on the first angiogram is it because there was a thrombus a completely thrombosed aneurysm which is completely recanalized is it because there was spasm of the distal basilar that's why we don't see it why did we see it on the first angiogram And it's a fairly large aneurysm. Yes, on, the, on the MR, you have shown that it was thrombosed. Yes, sir. But was it fully thrombosed? Because here, there is no semblance of an aneurysm. It doesn't look like there is anything at all here. Sir, and yes. what was the gap between the first... Uh, sir, uh, three weeks. Day? Three weeks, sir. Three weeks. Three weeks, yes, sir. In three weeks, it has completely reopened. And you can see that small daughter sac at the top, which would be the fragile one, which can bleed again. Yes, sir. So you've done right when you file that part of the aneurysm. Yes, sir. And I think your solution of a contour device here, an intracircular disruptor device, was excellent. Very good. Yes. And the long-term result also should be good. Yes. But I would repeat the DSC again after one year to see whether that small uh, at the neck where there is some filling, does it uh, still continue to fill? Yes, sir. This is the six-month follow-up has been good, sir. Correct. Uh, the okay. only need to do one more this, at one year. This is the six-month follow-up. The only worrying point was this part of the aneurysm. Correct. But Correct. I had to leave it to provide uh, to keep this superior cerebellar filling. Correct. So you'll have to do a DSA again yes. and see what is happening to that. Whether it is enlarging or whether it, sometimes it progresses to complete thrombosis. So that part may go at another six months. Are you what about your antiplatelets? Are you giving antiplatelets? Sir, I gave it only for four weeks initially, that to single antiplatelet ecosprain. And then for next five months, she has been off antiplatelets. And okay. this is post six months. So that may promote thrombosis. If you stop the antiplatelet, it may promote thrombosis. Yes. Very good. Excellent. Thank you. And Thank about you, the pica aneurysm, also, I think what you guys have done is a wonderful job. So you, you said you've not done a, a DSA, but uh, obviously with the endoscope you could see it all around, and uh, you clipped. So it was a direct clipping. So actually, it was during the COVID period. <laughs> we didn't have that thought. The possibility for the uh, in COVID period to get the DSA done, so we could uh, just uh, entered with the CT angio and the 3D anatomy was very much available, sir. That's why and posterior. No, no, it's very good. Yes, sir. CT angio is very good. Shows the angio very very good. So, so you use a temporary clip in these patients or you clip so generally we generally we avoid temporary clipping and for such a small caliber vessels it's really disastrous many a times it gets clogged and uh, you will find that the whole circulation gets uh, actually occluded so generally we try to avoid the temporary clipping and do you lower the blood pressure when you're doing it do you lower yes, the blood pressure so generally, it is around 60, 80 uh, between this uh, is the diastolic one and near about 100 is the systolic one, but not below that because generally posterior circulation aneurysms, they get uh, ruptured also. You are very much ready with the temporary clipping sort of thing. So there is no need to go below that, I think. It again leads to the unnecessary vasospasm of the vessels. Well, Sir. So I think that both the cases have been opened to the forum. Uh, I would like to have a comment from uh, Parito sir, Kishore sir, and obviously Sushil Patka sir has recently joined. So all the uh, senior members, I think uh, uh, first Parito sir. Yeah, I think both cases were very, very appropriately treated. Uh, distal pica aneurysms are very easy to treat, uh, unlike the proximal pica aneurysms. And uh, I, instead of doing a parent vessel occlusion of many of these things which have uh, tried to do, and these can be clipped quite easily. It comes just after you split the tonsils and everything. So it is completely fine. And the only thing is, I've never seen uh, an aneurysm completely disappearing and then appearing after three weeks. I mean, it is very, very, very strange. You must, you must report this because it's very, very unusual to have these kind of aneurysms which have completely disappeared. I mean, we see that there is some thrombus, there is some filling portion, but this looks like basilar occlusion and then completely taken care of. So I, I think you should report this. Is a probably very, a yes. dissection plus spasm, both the things. Yeah, yeah, probably. Probably it was completely thrombosed and then the thrombus uh, went off and then it yes. started filling or something. 
and uh, only one thing that uh, we we had stopped using uh, antiplatelets for quite some time uh, with contour devices but uh, i had a very recent case where I, we did a contour for a acom aneurysm and after some after one to two weeks he was he was on a single antiplatelet but after one to two weeks he had a small little stroke in the aca territory so uh, we still don't know how many days we should use these uh, uh, antiplatelets in these cases because the devices are very new we don't know the natural history all these things so probably we should continue it for a little longer and then stop it for some time i mean i'm just saying because still we know what is happening in these kind of patients so yeah very very well done yes Yes. I, I was having the same question in my mind, Parito sir, that uh, the guidelines for the use of antiplatelets in such uh, contour device used cases is not very much clear. So, so apparently they say that there is nothing needed, but there is a portion of metal which is there in the uh, uh, parent vessel. I mean, the uh, the detachment zone is still in the parent vessel itself. Mm -hmm. So we would probably need some antiplatelet for some time. Uh, we don't know because these devices are very, very new and we we, we are not sure how, much, how many days we have to do it. This was if a flexible artery, so I gave it for around four weeks and then I stopped it. Yeah, yeah, completely fine. I mean, I think completely makes sense. Yes. Of course, a lot of Nitin and everybody uh, don't even use coils in many of these patients after some time and they say that they have not uh, had any, many, any re-bleed. Uh, you would be uh, you'd be happy to know that uh, most of the ruptured cases for for which contour has been used has been used in india uh, and uh, the west has very very little uh, data for ruptured aneurysm contour cases uh, but uh, yeah i mean i, I, I think, think with that small daughter said that he had yes, that's that's you have you have to that. I, I think yes. just... and the weight was growing within 3 weeks i, I, I really like to put only a contour device there yes well, i agree with that yeah. Kishore, sir. Uh, I would, uh, I'll talk about the second case first. I was just thinking from a surgical point of view, I think even if it was three weeks post subarachnoid hemorrhage, I think surgically it would have been very challenging and you would have had either an intraoperative rupture and without very difficult to get proximal control and surely you would have, maybe one would have clipped the aneurysm but would have ended up sacrificing one of the superior cerebral arteries with very poor outcome. So I think you've done an excellent, excellent job. And we use contour very regularly. I didn't know whether that's a new or old. We've been using it for a while now. But uh, as Paritosh said, we use, prefer to use contour uh, and flow diversion mostly in cold cases. But this was kind of cold case. Uh, for contour device, our neurointerventionist, I think, put the patients on platelet, antiplatelets for four to six weeks. But I think they are getting more and more confident on not putting them on any antiplatelets at all. And we have not seen any disasters. So I think that is something probably to think about. Uh, it just shows, this second case just shows that where the interventional radiologist uh, has reached, where surgery <laughs> finds itself very difficult. About the second case, it's other way around. I think midline posterior fossa approach, we are all neurosurgeons very familiar with it. Plus, if we remove the adequate uh, margin of foramen of uh, uh, right. magnum and C1 arch, I think you can get approach not only to the dorsal part of pica, but also uh, the, the P2, P3, and except the proximal part, you can get very good approach to uh, the pica without any problems because pica provides itself adequate length. It's a long vessel. Uh, so that once we drain the CSF, surgery becomes relatively very easy. Plus, it's not that difficult to obtain any proximal control on the vertebral artery. Uh, the problem comes if the aneurysm is near the vertebral artery. So if it's a genuine pica origin aneurysm, then your lower cranial nerves uh, come into picture. And sometimes it becomes in, impossible not to manipulate them or not to interfere with their function. But it's a very good approach, very straightforward approach. And I also offer, although our own preference is for offering 
uh, endovascular approach as a matter of priority uh, for all the posterior circulation aneurysms. Those who are recurrent or difficult by endovascular means, uh, we tend to offer surgery. And this, your case is a perfect example how suitable a case could be for surgical intervention, even if it is posterior circulation. Well done. Thank you. Thanks. Sir. Patkar, sir. Hello, Sushil, sir. I think that he has joined and he has left, I think, right now. No, he's there. He's muted. Oh. Sushil, you are muted. Can you guys hear me? Sir, sir, sir. Sir, sir, you are no. coming on the yes. both the cases. If you have seen both the cases, sir. Both the cases were fantastic. Sir. I am on the I am not over the hill. I'm too old a monkey to learn new tricks. But what makes me happy is to see that the seeds planted by Dr. Karapurkar 30 years ago have uh, flourished and into big trees all over. I must congratulate both the both the speakers and I pay my obedience to Dr. Karapurkar who started all this. Thank you very much, sir. Dev Pujari, sir. I think all that needs to be said has been uh, said. The uh, more peripheral pica aneurysm, I think uh, uh, the only point I would like to say is uh, the endoscopic visualization and uh, how do you use it. I personally, in an acute aneurysm case, I don't use endoscope to begin with. I would probably do it after I have done a preliminary clipping to make sure that I have done it correctly or not. And if I have saved the distal vessel or any branching at that uh, point. So I usually avoid using it till uh, I have secured the aneurysm uh, in the best possible way with microsurgery. Sir, <clears throat> after opening the dura, after removing the subarachnoid hemorrhage, washing out, sir, I was also scared to put it, but just want to see because it has turned out to be a biologue. Oh, <laughs> I mean, it has worked out very well. It is, yes, sir, uh, that's why, uh, it is a good visualization. Uh, you have shown it very nicely. Uh, but I am just uh, saying that uh, it can be an issue. Yes, and sir. therefore, it may be safer to do it this way. Thank you. Any questions from the participants? Any questions? Well, I, I got one more suggestion for the distal pica aneurysms. That if, if you're approaching a distal pica aneurysms, and if, even if it is very visible on the surface, my suggestion is also please please wash out blood not only in the cisterna magna but also in the both CP angles as well. It is very easily accessible. You can flush out the blood and after a very good surgery, what you don't want is blood, a lot of blood in the posterior fossa cisterns spoiling your outcome. Sir, so I think that uh, uh, this is for the first case discussion. Uh, now we will move on to the second session that is on the CV junction. So I think uh, Sushil sir has already joined. Nupujari sir is here. Kishore sir is here. So I, I think uh, Sandeep, you can start with your presentation. Dr. Sandeep Irtwar. Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. yes. Can you share the screen? Sandeep is going to uh, speak on the CV junction case and then later on we will be having the rest of the discussion. At the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Pramod Giri sir for this opportunity and uh, team MCNS. Uh, am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, and Dr. Pramod Giri sir told me to present one or two cases of uh, CV junction anomalies. So, because the moderators, when I came to know, they are the masters on this subject. Uh, so, I'll just run through two cases and maybe third case can be discussed in detail. So, uh, as everyone knows, the craniovertebral junction uh, is known for complex surgical anatomy and poses clinical and therapeutic challenges. So, here I uh, discuss the first case, who is a 45 years female, a daily vegetable, who has presented with the progressive spastic quadriparesis in short and that's been progressing and she also has a cuff headache and on examination she had a short neck and a quadriparesis grade 4. So she was evaluated with a MRI brain which shows the tonsillar herniation, chiari malformation and there's a 
compression at the cervicomedullary junction and uh, then she was also evaluated but there is no ceilings she was evaluated with a dynamic x-ray of cv junction which did not reveal any uh, radiologically demonstrable cervical uh, vertebral instability so we got the ct scan done uh, along with the ct vertebral angiogram which shows the subluxation at the c1 c2 joint and the sagittal cuts so we did uh, uh, classical goels technique the c1 c2 fixation along with the foramen magnum decompression and she has recovered well and she is doing well so i'll just run through second case was 18 years boy who have, who also presented with the progressive quadruple paresis with a change in voice and with a preserved bladder and bowel function on examination she had a severe ataxia and lower cranial palsy and cuff reflex were poor so he was also evaluated with mri which shows the basilar invagination which is very well seen here we can see the severe compression at the cervicomedullary junction and this is a tight foramen magnum and you can see the posterior leap of foramen magnum also compressing the uh, CV, CM junction. And uh, on for the evaluation with the CT and X-rays with the vertebral angiogram, we are planning for uh, foramen magnum decompression and C1, C2 fixation. So in this case, what difficulty we had, uh, we could may not dissect the C1, C2 ja joints and the C2 joints is dissected. We could remove the articular cartilage, but the, 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 even after putting the traction, the distraction was not possible. So, and the, the C1 uh, lateral mass was also not well formed. So we have fixed the CV junction with the occipital lateral mass, uh, the occipit to C2, C2 lamina. And uh, then uh, on second stage, we did uh, a transoral approach because this vessellar invagination was causing uh, the deficits. And unless we decompress uh, the cervicomedial junction, we thought he won't improve. So we did the transoral uh, endoscopic plus microscopic odontectomy, and uh, following which he improved well. And uh, this is the third case, which I would like to discuss in detail, who is a five years boy, is a syndromic child, who had a multiple congenital anomalies. He underwent surgery for cyanotic heart disease. It's a total uh, anomalous pulmonary, pulmonary vent connection, which was operated immediately after birth within a few days. And subsequently, he had undergone surgery for cleft lip and then cleft palate in 2020. He presented to us with a torticollis and difficulty in walking. On examination, he is a very playful, alert boy without much deficits. The cranial nerves were normal. Motor examination did not reveal any significant neuro deficits. Uh, but he had a typical, this posture, very severe torticollis. You can see there's a scar on the chest of first cardiac surgery. And the right side tilted head and there's a short neck there's a nasal prongs there but otherwise he's a neurological preserve so on evaluation with ct scan and ct vertebral angiogram we thought he has got multiple uh, spinal vertebral anomalies like hemivertebrae at the uh, right from c1 to lower thoracic vertebrae. He had multiple hemivertebrae and he had a scoliosis in the thoracolumbar. And at cervical vertebral junction, it was a fused C1, C2 vertebra. And then on, on sagittal cuts, you see there's a vertical alignment of C1 junction. There's a vertical alignment. And the posterior foramen, if you see the posterior leap of the foramen magnum, that is going posteriorly pinching the cord. But on MRI, it did not reveal any significant compression. So he was, uh, this is the 3D images which you can see that there's a severe tilt. This is a C2 vertebra. And the, you can't see the C1, C2 separately. It's actually the fused C1 vertebra with the C2. And uh, C3, this 
core is also fused and anteriorly you cannot see the anatomy very clearly so on in front position he was taken up for surgery we had explored him uh, with a, a 2 kg traction after intubation and then we after exposing we found this c2 vertebra it's a tilted posteriorly and then after dissecting under microscope we could see the left c1 c2 or rather i should say it's a occiput to c2 joint was uh, bundle joint was uh, dissected with an open and it could be dissected further so that i could put the graft harvested from the electrist after dissecting it so once the one side joint was dissected the graft was fused and then we put the uh, screws as there was no c1 lateral mass on either side even the pedicles at C2 were also not clearly visible and the lamina was quite robust, it was big. So we put the screws in the C2 lamina on either side and then the occipital C2 fixation was done. And this was done under controlled movement without neuro monitoring, under controlled traction and there's a controlled dissection and distraction of the unilateral uh, uh, C1 uh, so-called occipitochondylar C2 joint and then once the graph was placed we have fixed and then we could uh, achieve some kind of uh, distraction and this is the final x-ray after uh, surgery and uh, fortunately this was corrected well and child is happy this is on first post of day and the child was dis, uh, discharged on third post of day without any neural deficits. So, considering all the complex, you know, every single case with a CV junction anomaly, we uh, see something different, we learn something new. But as a routine, we uh, follow intro traction during all the cases and we try to dissect the C2 ganglion, we try to uh, uh, do the neurectomy for a uh, a proper C1, C2 joint exposure so that we can mix on that. Thank you, sir. Nice case, uh, Sandeep. This is really a good bunch of cases. And uh, I'm very happy that uh, Dr. Praveen Salunke has also joined. Mm -hmm. So uh, after this, uh, seeing all these three cases, we have to uh, find out uh, the appropriate approach for the surgery and uh, second important issue uh, should be discussed is the uh, is the uh, particularly for the second case whether we have to go uh, posteriorly only or we have to address it for the uh, the transoral and posterior fusion on the very first approach itself so uh, i would like to uh, uh, request dr sushil patkar sir to please uh, give your comment on first this case sir Second case. Yeah, the second case where, where this is the second case, right? Which is on the screen. Yes. Sir. I would have definite. I would have definitely opted for the transoral odontoid before doing the posterior fixation, uh, because that was what was the cause of the neuro deficit. And sometimes in trying to fix from behind with this compression and in the prone position, you can add insult to injury. Second thing, uh, if you see the post-operative X-rays. I don't know whether you can see my cursor. Can you see my cursor on the screen? Hello? No, sir. No, sir. No, sir. In the sagittal section of the CT scan, where is the sagittal section of the CT scan? Can you show mm. me? I, I would have removed more of the C2, at least this, this upper part of the C2, which you can see that I would have removed. I would remove about half of the C2 because this is essentially where the pinch is taking place. These patients, when you do that, you know, you, you, we should not get impressed just by the CT images. If you do a myelogram and then you'll find how the dye gets held up. I am sure clinically also you can evaluate whether the patient will improve, but I would be more happy removing more of the C2 uh, in this case. And I would have done the transoral first. The second thing is that I always like to have these patients in traction, especially if it is an adult, for a few days at least before I offer them surgery. 
whatever is said and done, definitely the traction for a few days relaxes the um, the, the muscles, the, the, it, it, it pulls out the odontoid to some extent down. I don't know, uh, but in the past, all patients were put on traction for a few days before we offered transoral surgery because it helped in getting the odontoid a little bit down. And uh, I would always do the posterior surgery after the uh, transoral odontoid if the patient's symptomatology is because of this odontoid process. The third point in this case, I feel, is that uh, I am not happy with uh, laminar screws. It is very, very rare that you cannot put uh, uh, screws in the C2. With, with such a lot of bone, I would have passed the screws. I would have preferred to pass the screws just under the facet. If you can show me the CT scan 3D image of this patient, do you have them on the screen the C of case two, the CT images? Of do second case, CT sir? Of second case, the posterior, yeah, the preoperative CT images. So right now, uh, I have selected only in this PPT. Okay, okay. But... Fine, all right. I don't think that it is, it is not possible to put screws uh, just under the facet into the um, uh, C2 body. So, that, and that is a much more secure fixation than getting the fixation uh, on the lamina. Uh, in this case, I don't know whether you have put uh, bones inside the joint because this implant, and after removing the transrodontoid, and I'm not seeing any bone here posteriorly. Have you put any bone over here posteriorly between the screw rod system? Because eventually this will fail because the screws in the occiput also are not bicortical. What images you are showing, the screws have not gone bicortically. I would have preferred the screws to have gone a little bicortically. So this implant is, uh, for me, uh, it might uh, uh, fail eventually if fusion does not take place. Um, but the other case, even the case one, if you go to case one, uh, I would have liked to see the uh, preoperative CT scan if you had. This is a fantastic, uh, you have got a very good result in this case. In this case, also, had you put him in traction for some time, it would have reduced, but it has reduced very well on table. And uh, this is a good result. Where have you put the bone here in the joints? Or you have, you have not put any bone behind? So I presume that you have put bones in the joint. Is that right? Yes, sir. It's in the joint. Yeah. So I think that this is this is a very, very, very good result and a, and a good case that you have done where it has reduced and it has gone. As regarding the case, let's go to case three. If you see the case three, just go to the CT scan, the preoperative CT scan from behind. Yeah. Can you show me the 3D? Is there a 3D reconstruction on this scan? Yes, sir. Yeah, one minute, one minute. Yeah. You can easily put a screw over here and it will walk into the body of the C2. There's no reason why the screw will not walk into the body of the C2. You pass the screw from just under the facet joint. And these, uh, uh, you to manipulate the vertebra, uh, the lamina is a very, very weak option. Uh, somehow I'm very anxious uh, when, I, you know, when you're passing screws in the lamina, how long it will last and whether it will support the system. In this case, I would have definitely included more bones because there's, there's a lot of deformity just relying on the occiput and relying on the C2. I, I don't know whether you put screws down the C3, did you? Or only the C2? I said so, C2. Yeah, just show me the sagittal post-operative uh, image. Let's go to the sagittal CT scan post-op. See, here also, you're relying on how many screws did you put in the occipital bone? Three screws, sir. Three screws. And two in the, this, and to correct the deformity and hold that in that position without, uh, no, you know, sure. any grafting, I would be... Yeah, really I put the graft, sir. It's, graft the is joint. there, right side. Maybe this. In the joints? It's a unilateral graft. Where have you put the with, graft? Between the occiput and the C1 or the, or yeah. the joint? Yeah. Between so the occiput is... and the C1, yeah. So I think that yeah. is good. Would have put a bigger, bigger this, amount of this, bone over here, is... and maybe, maybe <clears throat> extend the fixation a little more down because the you no, know, or just to rely on the lamina of the C2 and the occiput, uh, it, it has worked. You are showing me a good result, but you have to wait for some time to see the long-term result of this. I don't know what uh, Praveen feels about this or Professor Goel if he's around. What is their opinion? I think Praveen is with us. Uh... Praveen, yeah. can you just comment on, you know, all, uh, all, done, all three cases were fantastic and <laughs> it had a good result. There's a challenge when, of... as far as this third case is concerned, the lamina yeah. was quite big enough and I tried to uh, dissect off, but I could not see the pedicle so that I could have passed through the pedicle. But uh, you don't pass through the pedicle, you go directly to the facet and pass it under the facet. The densest bone and C2 is under the facet. 
Yeah. Praveen? Yeah. Uh, can you hear me, Sandeep? Yes. Yeah, yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. yeah. so I, I just, uh, you know, um, this is, uh, I think you have got some really complex cases, especially the, the third one and the second one. The first mm -hmm. one appears to be relatively okay, reasonably easy to do, and you've achieved a reasonably good result in that. The right. second one, I would, I would actually, you know, not favor a occipital cervical fixation at all. So you have to understand if there is a atlantoaxial dislocation. There's nothing like a basilar invagination. It's actually the vertical invagination of the C2 within the C1. <clears throat> now, if it is fused, the C1 is assimilated to the to the C uh, to the occiput. So what happens is, rather than saying that there's no C1, it's difficult. You you know, go to the uh, if you have the the second case, the second case. We we'll first talk about the second case. So yeah, the, the second case, yeah, this one. So yeah. if you look at the the joints carefully, you haven't shown those images with the angio. So there will be a C1 C2 joint because if there's no C1 C2 joint, there cannot be atlantoaxial dislocation. So if for atlantoaxial dislocation to occur, there has to be C1, there has to be C2. Now the whole idea is that you need to reduce them, realign the C1 and C2, and fix it. OC fixation, you know, OC fixation, whatever you have seen, in my experience, this is going to fail with time. It does not hold. And believe me, even after putting in graft, because the, the fusion time is approximately three months, minimum three months, three to four months. And before it fuses, because of the cantilever effect, because you can understand the joints are way anterior to your construct. So this is going to fail with time. This will fail. Either the screws will come out or this will con continue to dislocate. And as uh, Professor Patkar said, I would also prefer to put in a C2 pedicle screw, sub screw, that's what he had described, and I've been using it, and that gives you the best result. So the best results are obtained if you put in the screws close to the joints. Don't try to you know, fuse uh, the occiput to the C2 with these laminar screws. At least I, I would not favor that. And the other thing which you mentioned about foramen magnum decompression, if you... Uh, actually reduce it completely. You know, you have to understand that the child was never born with a dislocated joint. He was born with a deformed joint. You need to correct deformity. You did not, you know, this compression is actually secondary to that dislocation. So, I mean, that is my opinion. Uh, obviously, at times you have difficulties. You can't really reduce the joint. You can't really reach up to the joints in your initial cases. With uh, As your experience increases, you'd say that, okay, I would do by just uh, uh, you know distracting the C1, C2 joints and fixing them close to each other. So that is, I would defer. But uh, obviously, I mean, under the given circumstances with whatever you have done, it looks okay. But again, I would say that try to put in a C2 subfacetal screw. And in this case, if you had to go for a transoral, I would have preferred to remove more bone, the C2 bone. Because even if you see now, there is a canal, uh, the, the canal is still not open up. It is not like a funnel. And it is still compromised. Uh, you yeah, uh, you you also uh, need to you know you mentioned something about the C2 neuronectomy. Uh, I am not sure whether that is uh, needed in all cases. Of course, in your initial cases, you need to expose the C1, C2 joints uh, properly. But it has its believe me, it has its own disadvantages. You have occipital ulcers, hypostasia, at least in five to eight percent of the cases, which is you know quite uh, devastating. Uh, now, if you come to the third case, Praveen, excuse me, Praveen. Yes. Yeah, just yeah, yes, one sir. thing. You know uh, about the odontoidectomy. You know, will you do it yes, for before posterior fixation or the posterior fixation first, uh, followed by uh, odontoidectomy? I, 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 I would, I would not do a, a odontoidectomy at all. I would right. try to reduce it because see, the whole idea would be like if you reduce the C1, C2, this is all going to get aligned. The C1 but and that's the biggest C2 challenge, sir. I mean, how yeah. to reduce it? Such a difficult task. Instead of actually, this patient was put on traction three to four days before yeah. surgery. Yeah. Okay. But still, still, uh, we couldn't see any gross difference. No, with 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 traction, you you really don't get any improvement in this, except for as uh, Parkas has said that there is relaxation of the muscles and it it opens up a bit, so that will ease you in your dissection. If even if it doesn't reduce traction, helps in dissection. That is that is what I believe. And of course, if it is not reducing attraction, you understand that it is a very difficult case. There is no doubt. So you have to expose the C1, C2, that, that area. The C1 actually facet is hardly seen because it is all covered by the C2. So you have to actually, you know, dissect the suboccipital 
portion which is covering the C1 facet and then put in your osteotome between the C1, C2 and then, uh, you know, open it up. So it's it's not easy. I understand that. And if you are not comfortable with that, this is fine. I mean, transoral with posterior fixation is fine. But uh, hello, Praveen, you are mute. Yeah. Multiple levels. Yeah, yeah, promote. Yeah. yeah. So Suresh, Suresh sir was asking about whether if you want to go for no, a... no. I would I would do a posterior fixation first. Give it a good try. If it is not reduced, if the odontoid still, I mean, if I see that there is residual compression, then I would go for a transfer. I so have whether to, I mean, you, whether you will fix the posteriorly first and then you will go transfer or you will yeah, if 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 at all it is required because the intent is not of transfer. The intent is of reduction, posterior right. reduction. So I'll try to reduce it, fix it, and if required, if it is not reducing, if it is, then I would go for a transfer. So, so that is uh, my take on that. And uh, when we talk about the third case, I'm not sure what was the uh, the reason why why did you actually you know uh, the 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 indication for surgery was only multiple deformities. The torticollis. Was it only torticollis? So you uh, think that this would have progressed with time? Was it progressing with time? It was progressing because I have been saying him for last uh, two years. Yeah. And every time he is coming with the uh, extra uh, angle towards the right side. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. So you feel that, and again, even in this, I would again agree with uh, Professor Patkar that you, you know, you can get in with sub -S. So the 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 C two is quite robust. So try to, I mean, I I would prefer putting in screws inside the C two body. Uh, I am not a, a a fan of uh, the C two laminar screws. It is easy. But uh, easy is not good. I, I mean, that is what I believe. You know, so right. it's it's and and you can actually get in with those subfacetal screws. It's not very difficult. The only thing you have to dissect it properly. Once you reach up to the facets, then you are hundred percent sure you can put in your screws inside the C two body and just you know uh, the the best word used for that is subfacetal. That is what I have been doing. And pedicle screws, those are the most robust, strongest screws. They're as compared to your laminar uh, screws and occipital cervical fixation. Again, here, I would again say it would always be appropriate. I, I mean, I, I am not sure you have so many deformities and why concentrate only on the C1, C2. Uh, I am not sure whether fixing the C1, C2 alone or OC fixation alone would take care of the scoliosis and other things. But maybe if you if you're saying that it is progressively increasing and you have you you fear that the deficits would worsen, then probably yes, C1C2 fixation uh, might be of some help. And again, I would like to see the angio and the CT scan preoperatively so that we can look at the joints. They mm -hmm. may be deformed, they may be, but we, we, the attempt should be to correct the joints and the deformity. It's a deformity correction surgery rather than just looking at you know fixation. Fixation, in situ fixation may not be a very good idea. So, so that is why my take, but of course, under the given circumstances, whatever, uh, you know, because, because I don't understand, I am not sure about the circumstances you have. There, there are many instances where you can't really attempt those uh, extremely uh, difficult cases because of the fear of outcomes, bad outcomes. So that's fine. I mean, I, I understand all those things. So all said and done, yes, you have really attempted uh, very difficult cases and the last two of them especially were, were quite difficult that is for sure and i must uh, yeah this is uh, you're doing a good job any role of navigation to look at the complex uh, uh, bony anatomy yes. in such cases no, not not for help? locating yes uh, yes 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 especially in these cases because at times you get lost at times yeah. you go especially in case three in case two, in your initial days, you might have to need, because you are not able to define it properly, all you see is C2. And at times, mm -hmm. the occiput, you get confused between the C2 and uh, the occipital condyle and the C1. So navigation may be helpful initially, but uh, with time, you will realize that it, it, it is not really required. In the, in the third case, the, the deformity is so gross that it is really confusing. You can get into the C2, but getting into C1, is, is going to be difficult. So that is where navigation would be of help. Yeah, uh, there is a question from Dr. Chandan Mohitni. Dr. Chandan? He's muted. Yeah, uh, yeah. so so not exactly a question. It's just a, a comment about this uh, laminar screw. I think uh, I agree with uh, both Professor uh, Patkar sir and uh, Salunke sir that uh, 
uh, the the area of action for CVJ is the C1 C2 joint. Uh, I personally we uh, I'm attached to Wadia Hospital, so we do a lot of uh, pediatric CVJs. Uh, so we rely lot of we rely a lot of on uh, translaminar screws as well, but uh, we do not go in for in situ uh, fusion. Just because you're getting translaminar screw does not mean that you're not going to go into the joint. I think joint has to be opened in every case, as Sir has rightly said uh, before me. But translaminar screws are robust, especially if you are trying to do a DCR uh, type of procedure uh, described by Ch Sharad Chandra, sir. Uh, I think that is one which has, uh, uh, which we are able to reproduce and we are having good result uh, with that. So for, I think for the second case, if you really, uh, I think Sandeep, uh, if you wanted to avoid the transoral, you could have attempted to do a DCR, but I, I, th I think I know what the problem was. I think the problem was the lack of monitoring. Uh, you are always with yeah. Dr. Sachin Borkar also regarding this case, yeah. whether I can attempt DCR. Right. And then he said, because the instrumentations are quite special and those right. instruments are not available in the market. So that's so why I couldn't proceed with the DCR technique. And, and monitoring, I think monitoring for that is a complex case, not an easy case. So I think monitoring is, is a must uh, during uh, these cases, for, especially for case two and case three. Yeah. So basic intention is to learn I means from masters. That's why I presented these complex cases. Yeah, the aim of this uh, presentations and this case yeah. presentation series is only that you can have comments from the masters of the particular faculty for particular uh, cases and particular section of the neurosurgery. Suresh, sir. No, I would agree with all these things. And I, I really uh, couldn't agree more with uh, Sushil in terms of you know how you manage all these things, right? Uh, from you know putting the patients on traction uh, and then you know rely more on the bone grafting the fusion with the bone grafting than the instrument part uh, and the third case is you know unless it is uh, a case where the patient is really deteriorating and all that you know uh, I think we should have observed that one but as uh, 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 said, yeah as you said he was deteriorating he was any, any role of uh, splitting yeah. muscles or mm. the sternocleidomastoid muscles are sometimes huh, slid to, uh, I don't know, I have not done it. So is it recommended to correct the torticle? Because the primary deformity is the bony anatomy, the bony deformity. So I don't think... Another, uh, I would like to add one command. Hello. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. In in uh, many times in an ad in adult patients, you do a good operation and uh, the story has ended. But in pediatric uh, population, we have to remember that this is a growing spine, and with so especially in case three with so many deformities down below. Uh, this deformity uh, might, might progress further and whatever operation you're planning has to be such that it is going to have multiple holes because eventually as the spine grows, the implant will fail. Mm -hmm. So whenever you're doing implants in pediatric uh, population, you have to be very, very careful and think at least until uh, what, what is going to happen to the implant till he finishes his growth, that is somewhere around about, around about 17 to 18 years of age. And uh, I'm very frightened before I take a decision to put implants in small children, especially where the torticolosis is not uh, just because of uh, C1, C2 and deformed uh, C1, C2 joints or vertebrae. There are so many vertebrae right down and that whole thing imbalance causes the torticolosis and not just the C1, C2 joint. And if you are doing that, and if you are saying that you are going to correct that, uh, you have to be, you have to counsel them well about the implant and the failure of the implant also. Uh, the, and lot of bone, the, 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 not just graft in the uh, joints, you should have a lot of bone even dorsally when you do this patients. Now, if Dr. Sharad Chandra has talked about putting the cage between the occiput and the C2. And he's, he calls this that as a pseudo joint. So I am, do not myself uh, kind of, you know, I've not done that, that thing and I do not know whether it works. I don't know what is um, uh, Dr. Professor Sanke's opinion 
about putting a spacer between the occiput and the C2 and correcting the deformity and getting the odontoid down? Uh, sir, I, I have seen a lot of cases with which have been operated outside. It appears simple, but it eventually fails because it, right. is not it, it is not physiological. You're holding, you're trying to put in a spacer in a very small, you know, that at, the, at, at that particular point, the C2, C2 isthmus, that is also very small and uh, it simply does not hold. You, we put in a large spacer, I don't know, because the joints have not been uh, tackled, joints have not been corrected. So I don't know whether it, uh, I have seen many cases who come with failures. So, but, in, in, but, but I would not be able to talk uh, about hundreds of them. I've seen two or three cases which, which have come to me with failure after DCR with that extra articular spacer. So if the, if the facets have been addressed, it works. If they haven't been, it usually fails. Yeah, so that, that is the point I wanted to make because unless and until you have the have the facet, at least when you have fixed the facet, the further deformity will not progress. But if you have not fixed the facet, eventually in a growing spine, the implant will fail. There is a comment from uh, Dr. Dev Pujari, sir. Uh, actually, I uh, was just going to comment on one aspect of this. I thought Dr. Sankla will already do that. One of the reasons why Dr. Patkar says and originally was described is to do the odontectomy first because it's otherwise very difficult to properly extend the head and get, uh, get the kind of position you require for transoral surgery. I think one major change that we have noticed is that nowadays posterior surgery is almost always done first. And most of the patients where we have done odontectomies are patients who have been uh, treated outside. Uh, with posterior fixation and the, when the odontoid has still not come down substantially. And in these kind of patients, without doing too much of movement uh, of the neck, you can actually do a much better job with endoscope because you, you can get that angle without uh, uh, too much effort, which is required for microscopic transoral odontectomy. So there is some advantage and you can do a good job in spite of uh, uh, having the posterior fixation already done. The one thing, technical point, I think uh, what uh, Sandeep has shown in his uh, uh, post-operative CT scan is that you can see that uh, odontoid probably could have been removed a little lower, but most importantly, the posterior margin of the bone has remained intact. So that that is an important aspect and you can use navigation or uh, sometimes if the CM doesn't work so well. So that is another thing. And uh, basically, I mean, unless you see the, uh, you know, uh, there is a proper folly of uh, dura and the membrane, uh, uh, tectorial membrane, you, you would not uh, consider that you have uh, been mm -hmm. able to go down substantially. So pre, uh, per operative imaging helps either a CM, good CM or a, a, a navigation in this case. I, I will add a little bit. Uh, navigation on its own can betray you many times. If you want to pass good screws, you must somehow attempt to get either the OAM with the navigation or the 3D CT, uh, 3D CM with the navigation. Navigation on its own, we have to remember, is done with the patient. Uh, the, the images which you are using are images which were done in the supine position. And when you give applied traction and when you have the patient, the OT, you are relying on those images which were collected when the patient was without traction in the CT scan to do the preoperative imaging. And that navigation can many a times betray you and even a few millimeters of betrayal is sufficient for disaster. But yes, if you have got navigation with intraop OAM, there is no way that you can make a mistake. Thank you, sir. Suresh, sir. Okay, so do we have anyone else uh, uh, want to make, who wants to make comments or uh, some kind of question? Chandan, are you, 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 done or you have some something in more to add adequately covered by all the bosses so if everything has been done and discussed and all that can we just uh, uh, conclude this thing and have you uh, uh, dr amol dr amol yes sir, yes, sir. you had some question dr amol yeah, actually, uh, I was uh, asking about the cost of uh, that new intervention device. 
costing amol it is around 8 to 9 lakhs rupees i think okay it's yeah. not affordable to pay whether there are any uh, social uh, worker or social uh, team helping out poor patient or needy patient uh, I, i don't think that right now it's not uh, really in vogue yeah. but definitely uh, over a period of time it is it, the price will go down yeah okay. yes sir thank you uh, thanks uh, sandeep uh, you presented nice cases and we had a very good discussion and we learned so many things uh you still have something to really uh, ask any of the faculty or anybody no sir i have learned a lot and definitely i'll try all to... right so yeah. uh, shall we go ahead and close the session uh, yes, sir, no, sir no, i think sir, that uh, yeah, yeah. i would yeah. i would like to thank all the speakers and all the participants faculty discussants panelists uh, and the moderators to uh, really put up this great show tonight Uh, and everybody learned so many things uh, uh, from this discussion this seminar so but thank you uh, uh, all of you very much and uh, call it a uh, uh, close this session and um, any any other announcement or something milen no oh, sir thank you sir saraj datta ji any no sir thank you so much that was a great thank you a great thank evening you, we sir. had thank you barito sir thank, thank you dr pasal ji dr thank you very much dr kartik thank, thank you thank you Good night, Good night, Doctor Giri. Thank you. Nice, Good night. 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 Good night.